Okay, so the title for this talk is Factorization Categories. So yesterday we uh, went over factorization spaces. The affine Grassmannian was the key example for us. Uh, so those were spaces that satisfy some kind of weird combinatorial pattern that says that they're the product as at different points, but the points are allowed to collide, and then they become the same. And we linearized, linearized factorization spaces. So how do you linearize a space? I don't know, take its cohomology. And we said that forms something we call the factorization algebra. And uh, today we're going to go sort of one level up and say another way to linearize a space is to take its D modules. And we'll think about factorization the factorization category of D modules on, say, the affine Grassmannian. Um, so the idea of a factorization category, that's going to largely repeat what I said yesterday, is that every time you have a set of points x1 up to xn inside of your curve, so is supposed to be pretty rough. So this is supposed to be assigned some category c sub x1 up to xn. And by category, I mean uh, a DG category. And by DG category, as with Dennis, I mean a co-complete DG category. Um, <coughs> so let me even just write that. Co-complete DG category, meaning it admits infinite direct sums. And this assignment should be uh, <coughs> this assignment should be continuous as the points xi are allowed to vary. Uh, and collide. Uh, so the example you're supposed to have in mind for this that we're going to construct, I mean, it's certainly very uh, intentionally vague at this point, but the example you're supposed to have in mind is uh, take points x1 up to xn on the curve, take the fiber of the affine Grassmannian there, the corresponding product, and take d modules on there. So that will eventually be something that satisfies this. No, we have all of these. Uh, all of the examples we gave yesterday will produce versions of this. It's just, you know, to have one thing to fall back on before. Um, and then there's the question of what are these things good for? So one answer is pretty close to the answer for uh, factorization algebras. So again, what you can think, oh, yeah, I forgot a crucial thing. So plus a factorization condition that says that if we have uh, x1 up to xm, xm plus 1, xn, all of these, I'm writing it this way to say they're different points, then what we should have is that the fiber of the category at the points x1 up to xn should be the tensor product in the sense of co-complete DG categories of the fibers um, at these two different sets of points. So it's the same, uh, which I could just write as the tensor product over all of these points. Uh, I, I live in the infinity category of DG categories, so I, I don't know the difference between those two things. I, for a strict model, it's like it's a homotopy functor or something, whatever you want to call it. But okay, so uh, I think you maybe that's 
such technical comment and does it much matter, but yesterday when you described spaces, so the map to the product was kind of like natural and coming from like the universal property of the product. You didn't actually mention this, you just demanded that the two things are equivalent, but you have a natural map. Here apparently you don't have it, you just demand that there is an equivalence of some sort. I, so, I mean, in practice, I, it's not true that like one part maps to the other nature of it. You mean just for some random category like this? Yes. Yeah, so I'm, I'm being very like kind of lazy about exactly what structures I require here. So they're written out in complete detail in various places, and it would, just, it would be inhumane to, to really go through that detail here. But what I really require is like a specified isomorphism and compatibilities. For example, if I further refine this set, then I expect two isomorphisms that I've constructed to be the same. If I whatever. If I allow these points to, these isomorphisms should be, again, continuous as I allow points to vary. Uh, every compatibility, every reasonable compatibility you could think of should be satisfied here. So someone should have told you this isomorphism. I'm not just asking that they are abstractly isomorphic. Does that address your question? Yes. Okay. And it was the same for factorization algebras yesterday, and it was the same for factorization spaces. So in examples, there are <coughs> obvious isomorphisms. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so now there's a problem, which is that, see, before we knew like, what a continuously varying family of vector spaces was over, say, a, ma like over a variety. It was just like a sheaf on that variety, a D module, let's say. Um, and here we've got more of a problem. We don't really know what a continuously varying family of categories is. So this leads to a brief digression on sheaves of categories. So what we're going to achieve with this is we're going to achieve some notion of sheaf of categories on any pre-stack. Yes, Dragosh. Say what are these good for? Oh, I, yeah, thank you. Uh, so what they're good for is the same thing that factorization algebras were good for. So you can think that the fiber sort of at one point, which is really all these fibers know, is encoding strictly lo local information. And that what's happening when you give this extension to the entire, like, entire run space here, when you define it for every finite set, you're doing something that will be useful for local to global applications. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about that more during, as the lecture goes on. But I have a question about this. You don't have to answer it now, but I want to get an answer at some point. Uh -huh. So it relates to something that Dennis said in his lecture on Sunday, that, that basically taking homology on run space has something to do with thinking down the product over all points of the curve. Yeah, I think that will be addressed during my tutorial. Uh, today? Uh, yeah, okay. hopefully. <laughs> um, OK, so sheaves of categories. So, uh, so what we'll achieve is every time someone gives you a pre-stack, we'll have some notion of sheaf of categories on that pre-stack. Um, and uh, that's a nice thing to have. So how can I possibly do this? Well, I don't have so many tools at my disposal. So the first thing I need to do is do it for affine schemes, because pre-stacks are a, a very formally defined thing out of affine schemes. They're just the category of contravariant functors to groupoids. So, uh, so for S an affine scheme, I'm going to define sheaves of categories over S. So this will be uh, a certain category. And, uh, and the rule is that, OK, if S is spec A, then A mod, I want to say it's a symmetric monoidal category under tensor product. Let me say something slightly more precise. So this is a commutative algebra in the world of DG categories. That's what I'm, uh, uh, so I, I'm defining this. What you really want to describe is the notion of sheaf of DG. Yes. So I'm just going to call it sheaf of categories for. Sheaf here is supposed to mean what? I mean, is this like notion of coherent sheaf or the module of work? We'll get there. Let me give a definition before we analyze it too closely, because otherwise we'll just never get there. So I, I haven't defined anything yet. I, I think that was the question. So what I want to define is a notion of sheaf of categories on some uh, affine scheme. <coughs> uh, 
Yeah, so this is the same as quasi co of spec A of S. Yeah. Actually, that would have saved me a little bit of trouble. So then, by definition, a sheaf of categories on this affine scheme is a quasi co of S module category in DGCAT. So remember, again, DGCAT, these are co-complete DG categories. And this is a, uh, well, and we're using tensor product of co-complete DG categories when we talk about this. So OK, so uh, if I have a monoidal category, like monoidal infinity category. Sure. Let me, let me say it a little more explicitly. So if I have like, let's say, uh, a, a, well, monoid, a monoidal DG category in the sense that it's, let's say, an algebra in the world of DG categories. So first of all, what does that mean? What it means that A is an algebra is that I am equipped with some tensor product structure on A, which really means that I have some functor from the tensor product of DG categories. OK, so maybe this is bad notation, star. I have some functor star here, and it satisfies lots of higher compatibilities. Um, what it means to be a module category for this now is that you're given some C in DGCAT, and you're given now functors from A tensor with C to C, like action functors, plus again, higher compatibilities. But at least at first order, this is what it means. Uh, yes. Yeah, so it, you, it's closer to analog of quasi coherent <coughs> at this point. Um, OK, so uh, great. So, so the, the, this is the, the meaning of the definition. So uh, you can think about these. I mean, there's a precise sense in which you can think about these in the affine case as being categories whose HOMs are enriched over the commutative algebra A. Um, so that gives you a really simple way of thinking about them. So for example, uh, modules over a ring are supposed to be a sheaf of categories over the center of that ring. And that's literally true. Um, OK, so now I'm going to define sheaves of categories for arbitrary pre-stacks. So the fast way to say it is that this is, actually, before doing that, if S to T is a map of affine schemes, then I have a functor F star from sheaves of categories over T to sheaves of categories over S. Namely, it just sends like a quasi co of T module. So it, that's what it means to, for a category to live here. So C maps to uh, C tensor over quasi co of T with quasi co of S, where this is the symmetric monoidal functor of pullback. Um, the functor actually admits a right adjoint of restriction. So it's behaving exactly like it did when we were setting up quasi co. Um, OK, so now I can define sheaves of categories for arbitrary pre-stacks very formally. Sorry? Yes. Uh, yes, left adjoint to f lower star. It's not defined. We won't really use it in a serious way. It's nice, actually. but. OK, so sheaves of categories uh, over blah. So this is defined as the right con extension formally, which in practice, so the same way we've defined all of our functors. And in practice, what that means is that if you give me some pre-stack y, then a sheaf of categories over y is the same thing as a compatible system of sheaves of categories over affine schemes as those affine schemes map to y. So this is the set of compatible systems, uh, 
C sub S in sheaf cat over S defined for every function from S to Y. So these should be compatible under further restrictions. Excellent question. No. But <clears throat> let's make another definition. So the terminology is due to Dennis. So a pre-stack y, well, OK. I'll need to put it off to one more board. We'll, we'll address your question to some degree in a second, I promise. So uh, basic games we can play with these sheaves of categories. So first of all, by definition, it's a contravariant functor. This pullback extends to a, a pullback functor for uh, you know, any morphism of pre-stacks. Uh, so that's the first comment. Uh, second comment is, uh, well, you can prove various nice theorems about this. It satisfies sort of FPPF descent, that kind of stuff. Uh, and another construction is global sections. So given y a pre-stack and c a sheaf of categories on y, I'm going to define the global sections functor of y uh, with coefficients in c to be the limit of global sections of uh, s with coefficients in f star of c defined for all maps uh, f from s to C, and where, and certainly, whoops, Y, and certainly where S is an affine scheme. So, uh, so here, uh, what global sections means for an affine scheme, by definition, this is like the underlying module category. The underlying category of the module category. So here's an example. So I can define a certain uh, pre-stack quasi-co over y. And by definition, I have to tell you what this is every time you, OK, so for every f from s to y, this attaches the category uh, quasi-co of s considered as a quasi-co of s module category. And in this case, what happens? So we can take global sections of y with coefficients in quasi-co. And by definition, this is the limit of the categories quasi-co of s over all maps from an affine scheme to y. So this is some limit over s of quasi-co of s, which is exactly what we defined uh, quasi-co of y to be. In fact, what you can see is that, OK, what you can see is that uh, the functor global sections actually upgrades to a functor from sheaves of categories over S. So we said it maps to DGCAT, but at least I should have said that. Maps to DGCAT, it actually maps further. So it maps to quasi, nope, Y. It maps to quasi co of Y module categories in DGCAT. So this is an analog of the fact that if you have any pre-stack and any quasi-coherent sheaf on it and you take its global sections, that will be a module for global sections of y with coefficients in its functions. Um, so, so sometimes this functor is an equivalence. For example, if y is an affine scheme, it's tautologically an equivalence. Um, and in the usual setting of algebraic geometry, there's a theorem of Sarah that says, for example, if you're a scheme, then you're affine if this functor is an equivalence. 
um, if and only if. And uh, great. So definition terminology is due to Dennis. So and the notion a pre-stack y is called one affine. This being meant as a categorical upgrade of affinity if the functor star is an equivalence. If you did it not with shift category, but with the usual shifts, for pre stacks, uh, somehow you probably don't still, it won't, it won't be true that uh, being a fine would be equivalent to. Right, so for example, BGA satisfies this property. Yes, or. Yeah. So Okay, so a theorem of Dennis gives. Okay. This is DG. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so Dennis says the following: uh, pre stacks are one affine. So obviously, this notion is not good for anything if we can't find so many examples. So the first one is that if S is any quasi-compact, quasi-separated scheme, quasi-compact, which if you've never played with these things before, think, maybe people will get mad at me, think finite type, or think affine. Uh, quasi-compact, quasi-separated scheme, uh, then it's one affine. So already this stands in really stark contrast to the situation a categorical level down, where the only, say, quasi-compact, quasi-separated schemes satisfying this property are affine schemes, satisfying the you know, downgraded version of this property. Another one is S Durham for any S finite type, a finite type scheme. Um, over spec k. And if they don't have any assumptions on k or no, it's just you mean like algebraically closed or something. Uh, characteristic zero. Uh, characteristic zero. I, just to deal with Durham, let's be in characteristic zero. Yes. Um, and Dennis also proves this for various algebraic stacks, but it's a more complicated statement, so I won't give it. Um, okay, so what that, okay, so example, so there's this little bit of discussion earlier. When I say sheaf of categories, am I thinking something quasi-coherent? Am I thinking something kind of uh, demodular? So an example is that if I take y to be s Durham for s of finite type scheme, then uh, I can think about about sheaves of categories on S, on S, Durham, as crystals of categories over S, DG categories. Namely, I can do this using the Durham groupoid. So, you know, more, more or less what like just the definition of S Durham in terms of the Durham groupoid says is that any time you give me two infinitesimally close points of S, then I need to give you an identification between the restriction of the corresponding sheaf of categories on S. Um, and then what the theorem says is that this global sections functor from sheaves of categories over S Durham to D of S modules is an equivalence. So, well, it's D of S is D modules on S. Yeah. 
Um, it's in digi categories, yeah. Uh -huh. This first result in the theorem, is, is it like uh, related to the theorem of Wanda van der Berg about that, uh, well, the category of, of wise coherent sheets that derive one on a scheme like that? I mean, it's a generator. Uh, it's, well, it's less important. It, it's, it's uh, the fact that, that these are the conditions you need in order to make the category compactly generated is not a coincidence. Yeah. So. But it doesn't, there's no like strict logical relationship between the two results as far as I know. Um. Okay, so. Uh, Uh, Luxus satisfies it, Bungie. No. Okay. Yeah, so, so BG will satisfy this, BG Duram will not satisfy this. Um, it will be discussed during the tutorial. Okay, so, uh, so the theorem says something. So now we're at least equipped to talk about sheaves of categories, like, we can finally talk about factorization categories because, I mean, we have the language for it now. We know the problem was that we need to know what a sheaf on Xteram, sheaf of categories on Xteram to the i was, and now we know. So, uh, yeah, which means I can erase this. Actually, quick discussion about sheaves of categories on Ron space. Maybe I should stop and just ask, are there any other questions before I move on? Yes? So D, D, for me, D of S is D modules on S. And what I'm saying is D of S mod inside of DGcat. So I'm considering it as a symmetric monoidal category through its global sections. Um, so yeah. <coughs> Um, okay, so uh, so sheaves of categories on Ron X. For simplicity, I'm going to do uh, Ron X drum. Not for simplicity, but just for making a choice. So okay, so what what is sheaves of categories over Ron X drum? Like, how do we think about them? So answer is that. By definition, remember, uh, no. Well, I don't know if it's answered, but I don't think so. And if you remove Duram? Uh, if you re remove Duram, I think you're in worse shape. Yeah. And excuse me, maybe you're coming to this, but what is 2 affine or 3 affine? You don't need this. Why 1 affine? Uh, well, 1 affine as opposed to 0 affine, but exercise guess 2 affine. OK, so uh, Ron X to Rom. So this is the co-limit under finite sets i of x to the i to Rom. Let's remember. There was a certain, I mean, literally Ron X was defined as the co-limit of x to the i's, and then we're taking Durham of it. But there was a claim yesterday that if you think out what the terms mean, it's the same as this. So what that means is that sheaves of categories over y, not over y, over ron x to rom. This is the limit of the categories of sheaves of categories over each x to the i to rom. Um, and we know what this category is. This is the limit under i in f set of D of x to the i module categories inside of DGCAT. Uh, it's true for every co-limit. So uh, it's a general fact about uh, like the well, well the I don't know Yoneda or pre-sheaf category on some category. If you take the left con extension of some functor, then it will send co-limits to co-limits. Or I mean, here it's contravariant. So it sends co-limits to limits. Um, OK. So 
uh, yeah, so literally every colimit in pre-stack gets sent to one here. This is what's nice about this FPPF descent theorem is that that means colimits and stacks also get sent to limits, which isn't a priori clear. Um, okay, so uh, yeah. So what does that mean explicitly? It means that for every finite set i, I'm supposed to define some category c sub x to the i, maybe it'd be better to call it c sub x to rom to the i, but, um, and this should be some dg category. And moreover, it should be a module for d of x to the i. So just, again, to sort of spell out what this means, so this category is equipped with some symmetric monoidal structure. The unit is the dualizing sheaf. Um, and, you know, I can think, oh, I have all of these other objects to tensor with. So I can tensor with differential operators. I can tensor with delta functions. Tensoring with delta functions you think of as like taking the fiber at a point. Um, projection onto that fiber. So, uh, okay, so for every finite set i, I'm supposed to give you some DG category with this extra structure. And then moreover, um, Every time I'm given a surjection of finite sets, I onto J, what I need to give you, so remember that induces the diagonal map delta F from X to the J to X to the I. And, well, you know, what our earlier thing would have said is to take delta F upper star of CXI and give an isomorphism between that and CXJ. But what it says in terms of these sort of global sections, using the one affinity is that that is that C X I tensor over D of X to the I with D of X to the J, we should specify an isomorphism between that and C sub X to the J. Um, and that should be an isomorphism of D of X to the J module categories where this is actually on, on the right. Sorry, uh, can I slow down? So when we talk about this, we consider uh, kind of the left, left the model, you need some, some other structures. Uh, okay, so if I think about D modules as either quasi co or in. Uh, for either one, I have a symmetric monoidal structure. So on, on int co, there, there is, uh, at least under nice conditions, there is a symmetric monoidal structure where the dualizing sheaf is the unit. So it's just given by like take exterior product, shriek restrict along the diagonal map. So it, it's something, it's, it's less frequently used than the quasi-co-symmetric monoidal structure. But here, they, they identify under the quasi-code int co thing. Yes, David? On this right-hand board, do you not mean to say that the theorem says you have an equivalence with D of S modules modules? Uh, no. Well, D, D of S means the category of D modules on S. Yeah. Uh, not that I know of. Yeah, so counterexamples take some, some work. And what's the example of a free step which is not? Uh, B, G, A, Duram, let's say. So maybe we could work it out in the tutorial. Yeah, that was <coughs> fun. <coughs> yes, Georgia. Yeah, so, so it's an important point. So when I write upper star here, like the, so, so this is related to, to Arkhipov's question. So when I, OK, there is this game where we can think about D modules on S as being quasi-coherent sheaves on s -Duram or int-coherent sheaves on s -Duram. And in both pictures, like the quasi-co picture and the int-co picture, you have some contravariant functoriality. So you have star pullback for quasi-co, and you have shriek pullback for int-co on, on general pre-stacks. And if you play the, the quasi-co game for esteram, for like a map esteram to teteram, the star pullback will correspond to what we always call the shriek pullback. 
um, in the theory of D modules. And if you apply the shriek pullback in the int co world, you'll still obtain the shriek pullback in the D module world. So like when you identify the quasi co and int co picture, they, they both give you the shriek functor. So here I, I just, you know, I have one notation for morphisms of sheaves of categories, but what it corresponds to is tensoring along the functor from d of x to the i, d of x to the j of shriek restriction. Like that's what this functor is. And it actually is the upper star functor in the quasi co picture, conveniently, but on uh, uh, quasi co on exterom, yeah. Okay, D modules and Y D modules? Uh, D modules, I, I, it's uh, quasi co or int co of uh, esteram. Okay, okay, it's quasi co of esteram. So, uh, uh, so I, I'm, I'm not thinking about it as modules over an algebra. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, okay, so what that buys us now, okay, so actually convention, I'm going to be loose, will be loose for spaces like x drum or x to the i drum uh, about the difference between between sheaves of categories and uh, say d of x to the i module categories in dgcat. Yeah, so just, I should say, to spell it out a little more, I keep saying in dgcat the reason is that what that really translates to is that I'm saying the action functor sends like co-limits in either variable to co-limits. It means I'm really using this tensor product structure on DGCAT. Um, okay, so now we can give the definition. So a factorization category on X is a rule uh, sending each finite set I, so uh, to some C sub X to the I, well, actually I'm going to choose the other notation. A sheaf of categories over x drum to the i um, that satisfies two axioms. So, <coughs> uh, first of all, it satisfies Ron's axiom. So, uh, such that, first of all, uh, every time we have a surjection, from i onto j, if you give me the corresponding diagonal map, I should be given an isomorphism with c sub x to the j in sheaves of categories over xj, the realm. OK, that's impossible. Over x to realm to the j. Um, and the second one is factorization. And what that says is that every time I have a decomposition of my finite set i into the union of two other sets, i1 and i2, I should be given an isomorphism between the following two gadgets. So the first thing I can do is I can take x to the i and I can restrict it to this locus we had yesterday of xi1 cross xi2 disjoint locus. So remember if uh, i1 and i2 are singleton sets, then uh, this is the complement to the diagonal. Um, 
And here restriction means we have this pullback functor for sheaves of categories. And I should be given an isomorphism here between this category and, uh, and the category CXI1 box times CXI2 restricted to the same disjoint locus. Uh, it, it says slightly more than that. Uh, well, I, I, okay, I, I personally don't know if Ron's space is 1fine. If it is 1fine, it's equivalent to what you're saying. Otherwise, it's slightly more. Um, but, what it really, but it gives you, for example, an action of D modules on Ron's space on the kind of global sections. Um, yeah. So, uh, so condition one is equivalent by what we said earlier to saying that we have some specified sheaf of categories, C sub Ron X, a sheaf of categories on Ron X drum. Um, and fair question is what's exterior product here? We know what exterior product is for sheaves. So uh, the laziest way I can say this, though it's also not so wrong, is that since these guys are 1fine, I have a d of x to the i1 module category, a d of x to the i2 module category. I just tensor them and consider them as a module for the tensor product. Um, so, uh, great. Any questions? Um, so, Yeah, right. So I should give uh, 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 a fact here. So, OK, the second one will absorb the first. But if I'm given two finite type schemes, S and T, um, then that implies that, well, I have a certain functor from D of S tensor D of T to D of S times T. So this is really like kind of exterior product functor. Um, and this is actually an equivalence of categories. So you know, the functor makes sense. So, so giving a functor from here to here means giving a functor from d of s and times d of t to here that sends colimits in either variable to colimits. And what I do is if you give me a d module on s and a d module on t, I take their exterior product on s times t. And the claim is that that particular functor induces an equivalence on the tensor product. Um, and there's a slightly more general version. So uh, I ran out of letters. Uh, S1, so given S1 mapping to T and S2 mapping to T, I can play a similar game where I take the functor from D of S1 times D of S2 to D of the fiber product. And first of all, the claim is that this functor factors through the category like this and gives an equivalence. Um, so I want to state this lemma explicitly. I'm, it's going to kind of be in the background a little bit for what I'm saying. Actually, a good uh, exercise is to deduce uh, both of these statements from one affinity of x to rom. <coughs> Sorry? Uh, I, I don't uh, know the answer. I don't think it's true, but I just don't know. Uh, right, because it, it's formal because what I'm what I'm saying is a compatible system of sheaves of categories on each x to the i is the same thing as a sheaf of categories on run. So, so that statement is formal. And then what's, what's not formal, what, what is like a theorem of Dennis, is that 
a compatible system of D of X to the I module categories. It's the same thing as a sheaf of categories on run. Which it, the former thing is different from a sheaf of from a D of run X module category. So Um, okay, so uh, so now some examples. So the first example is the easiest one. So if I attach to a finite set um, i, the category d of x to the i, considered as a module category over itself, this factorizes. Um, it's, this is an analog of the fact we saw yesterday that omega defines a, uh, a factorization sheaf on uh, a factorization algebra on x. So the fact is, like this thing, this d of x to the i corresponds to quasi co of xi Durham, and any time you pull back quasi co, you get quasi co canonically. Um, so that's one example. A second example is that if we send i to the category d of ger g sub x to the i. Uh, so I can think about this as a d of x to the i module category. Um, so what's the procedure? Actually, any time I have a map, say, y to x, I can think about d modules on y as a d of x module category by the operation pullback and tensor. In other words, I have a symmetric monoidal functor of pullback from d of x to the i to d of ger g x to the i. Um, so, good. OK, so now uh, I just want to comment briefly on, uh, on the local to global aspects of, of the subject. So unfortunately, there's no theory of chiral homology. So you could imagine a fantasy world in which uh, there is a theory of chiral homology. So one thing we're going to do during the tutorial is we're going to explain that in the same way that yesterday we attached a factorization algebra to a commutative algebra, you can attach a factorization category to a submetric monoidal category. So there will be some factorization category that's like rep G, or if you want, rep G check. And in a fantasy world, you could think, take chiral homology of that category, and maybe you get quasi-co of loc cis, and you've reduced geometric Langlands to, uh, to a local statement. Um, unfortunately, there's no such theory of chiral homology. Like, uh, th there just isn't, um, and it's too bad. But there are various substitutes. Um, n not substitutes, but there are just, the local to global aspect still gets played out. Um, so uh, here's one example of local to global that Nick will talk about in detail today, tomorrow, tomorrow. tomorrow. So one thing that this procedure with the affine Grassmannian lets us do is that we can take ger g uh, Ron X. So this can be interpreted in two different ways. You can interpret it by really making sense of this space, ger G Ron X. So we produced affine Grassmann like Balance and Drinfeld affine Grassmannians over each X to the I and just pass to the co-limit in the world of pre stacks and take D modules. Um, so well, it makes sense. Another thing you could do is say take the global sections of this category. Um, yeah. Uh, if you have a factorization space and you take D modules over it, do you get a factorization category? Uh, yeah, so it, you, you have to be a little careful, but basically, yes. So, so some of our factorization spaces, well. That's how you hook up that example? Yeah, so, so this example follows from these two facts. So, because there was some tensor product appearing on the one hand, 
So you, you, know, you need this kind of result in order to do that. You need to say that some products or fiber products are being turned into tensor products at the level of D modules. Um, just like that's how the definitions work. Um, so, so there is a functor from D modules on Bungie to D modules on Gurji uh, run X. Because by definition, this is the limit of the categories of uh, D modules on Gurji X to the I. And we have compatible functors from uh, Gurji X to the I to Bungie. By the way, X is now smooth and proper. Uh, uh, yes, forgetful, forgetful, whatever. Map. Um, so, note when I say compatible here, these are compatible with diagonal maps, which are the relevant ones here. They aren't compatible with factorization. Um, so, left hand side is, uh, counts G bundles with uh, full structures at five points. Uh, no, it's the opposite thing. So it's a G bundle with a trivialization away from I points. Oh, right. Yes. So just forget that trivialization, and this is your G bundle. So a theorem due to Dennis um, though inspired by also work from Balenson and Drinfeld says that, so I'll just call this pi upper shriek out of laziness. So pi upper shriek is fully faithful. Um, so a quick corollary is the fact I said before, which was that the homology of, of bun G is mapped isomorphically from the homology of G run X. Namely, take the dualizing sheaf on bun G. I don't know, pull it back, shriek, push it forward twice or so, and you'll get this claim. Um, so you have to know something for this corollary, right? So you have to know the fibers. Or... Uh, the, the corollary follows from this fact. Oh, so fully faithful. Fully faithful, yeah. So derived fully faithful, yeah. So I mean, what you can think is that the fibers are contractible. Like, this almost never happens in finite dimensional algebraic geometry unless, say, the fibers are A1. So if the fibers are A1, this kind of statement is familiar. Um, but yeah, so but when you pass to infinite dimensions, you can get things like the infinite dimensional sphere is contractible. Um, so. Um, and yeah, so this is a really nice theorem. It will be discussed more how you prove it, the kinds of comments we're making now. But I just want to say what it gives you is a purely local description of the category of, or not a local embedding of the category of D modules on Bungie. Um, like this, this thing is local. It, you know, the affine Grassmannian is really an object, like the fiber at a point is really an object of local geometric Langlands. And we're saying that when you allowed points to collide, you've done something that was like smart enough to remember everything about D modules on Bun G, except for sort of the automorphy condition. So, um, so that will be discussed more later. Um, any questions? I think I'm out of time. All right. Thank you.